From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Jerry Firestein, Director of Gulf Affairs and Government Relations at the Middle East Institute, filling in this week for Paul Salem, who is on vacation. It's been nearly a month since the Saudi-led coalition spearheaded by Emirati forces and supported by Yemeni militias launched offensive operations around the strategic port and city of Hodeida on Yemen's Red Sea coast. Amid concerns that a battle for the city could have a catastrophic effect on Yemeni civilians. At the time, senior coalition leaders expressed optimism that the pressure they would exert on the port, not only militarily but financially crucial to the Houthis' rebel war effort, would enable new UN Special Envoy Martin Griffiths to negotiate a peaceful handover of the port to third-party management and convince the Houthis to return to the negotiating table for the first time since August 2016. Since then, Griffiths has engaged in shuttle diplomacy between Sana'a, Aden, and the coalition capitals in an effort to gain momentum on the political front. Will the coalition strategy achieve its goals? Can Martin Griffiths convince the Houthis to return to negotiations and agree to a political resolution of the conflict now into its fourth year? What has been the impact of this new round of fighting on the Yemeni people? Here to help me answer these questions are Fatima Al-Asrar, Senior Analyst at the Arabia Foundation, and Samal Hamdani, Director of the Yemen Cultural Institute for Heritage and the Arts and a visiting fellow at Georgetown University. Welcome to you both. Fatima, let me begin with you. We've heard from coalition leaders recently that their military operations are in a strategic pause to give Martin Griffiths space to negotiate with the Houthis. Can you update us on your understanding of the current situation on the ground in and around Hodeida? Um, where are the coalition forces today? The military operations in Hodeida started exactly a month ago. This was by Yemeni forces. It was composed from the Amalika brigades, as, which are predominantly southern forces, the Republican guards, the elite guards of former President Ali Abdullah Saleh, and as well the local Tihama forces from the area. And all of them are brought together or stitched up by the Arab coalition, as we know. So they were brought there to apply pressure on the Houthi rebels who have been controlling the port and the city of Hodeida. And, you know, some might think that this is an operation where you're just trying to seize the port. Of course, the Yemeni president, Hadi, said that he wants to get also the city under his control and pretty much restore back the majority of Yemeni cities back to the internationally recognized government authority, restore the rule of law and abide by the constitution that was just hindered in this process of the Houthi takeover uh, of Yemen in 2014. So the operation was to liberate the city of Hodeida, which has been occupied since then, and um, restore the city and the port. And so far, we have seen that the operations have you know, been somewhat successful and quick. One of the biggest, uh, of course, news was the takeover of the Hodeida airport, which fell quite quickly. But at the same time, there are skirmishes around the airport. As you can imagine, the Houthis are still trying to, you know, fight for it. And and um, I mean, despite despite their their loss um, in that area, there are other areas. Um, just a few days ago, at Tahita, which is in the southern part of the city in Hodeida has also fell. And we you, we were able to see the Yemeni forces inside the the souq of, of Tahita. So now these are all very significant. There has been somewhat a pause, sort of like a, maybe a one, one week to 10 days pause that we saw. And that was where I think, I mean, pause around trying to advance further. And I think this is a prudent pause to give uh, the UN special envoy space as he is trying to resume negotiations and uh, relaunch the negotiations and uh, come to 
some type of a resolution in Hudaydah, which is very and an attempt to, of course, um, you know, maybe stop from a humanitarian crisis mm-hmm. that was prophesized by mm-hmm. many of the of the aid agencies. Now, I think this is prudent, and I think it's also prudent not to push the many forces into a battle that could be quite risky because the Houthis still have really significant control over the city and they're prepared to die for the port. So we've seen um, reports that got from local organizations have have said that there were around, you know, 100 trenches dug mm-hmm. by the Houthis. There's also a tremendous amount of landmines that the Yemeni armed forces are clearing step by step. So it's a slow and steady operation. I think it's a it's a careful attempt to, you know, take back the city and also not, you know, also like the Arab coalition is also under significant pressure not to cause any type of, you know, humanitarian suffering, but also... They're under pressure as well not to make mistakes in terms of targeting and airstrikes, which are going to be important during this operation. Well, if I can ask you specifically about the city, uh, and it appeared that the strategy that the coalition was pursuing was to try to go around the city. Uh, the airport, of course, is south of Hodeida, and that is um, in coalition hands. The port is to the north. Uh, And it looked like they were going to try to swing around the city and attack the port without having to go through. And so uh, is that a strategy that could succeed? Uh, As you said, of course, it looks like the Houthis are planning uh, specifically to, to make their last stand, if you will, inside the city itself. And that would be the the issue that would of course raise the largest humanitarian concern about casualties. Yeah, I I think that um the two issues here. I think that it's quite risky to try to attempt to take the port at the moment. Um and it's it's risky for them any joint forces as well. I mean as as I've mentioned, the reports of of Houthis fortifying their positions, um, uh, putting more reinforcements, digging trenches, they're really well prepared uh, for this battle. And now I think the the humanitarian organizations have pro- prophesized a, cat- a humanitarian catastrophe in terms of that if the if the port is subjected to any strike or be hindered or you know shelling from the Houthi militia, any of that could hinder the port capacity. Capacity. I th- I personally think that there are other alternatives for the port for the food to come in. But if we're talking about you know the humanitarian like sort of like if we're talking about the loss of lives and the loss of lives of both the civilians and and the Yemeni armed forces, many of which are from the city of Hodeida itself, is something that we have to really um, be wary of. So I think that here the political solution is important. I think that the fact that the the military pressure has led to the the Houthis acquiescing to the UN management of the port. Now, of course, the Houthis have said that they wanted to retain the money from mm-hmm. and the resources from the port, which from the port, which does not make sense. It's a yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. it's an important it's an important revenue for them. They make around thirty million dollars a month from the port. So I think you know that that defeats the purpose. Ultimately, you need to weaken the Houthis and Hodeida. You need to. Give, get that incentive for them to negotiate and talk to the to the to the envoy. I think without that pressure, we probably wouldn't have been there. So I think it's a significant step forward. Well, let me ask you, Samai. I mean, picking up on on that point, of course, we've seen Martin Griffiths undergoing the the shuttle diplomacy. He's been in Aden a couple of times to meet with President Hadi. He's met uh, with Abdul Malik Al Houthi a, a couple of times in in Sanaa or in Saada. He expresses optimism. He says that he thinks that he's making progress. Uh, what's your sense uh, of the the possibility that this military operation that Fatima has been describing is actually going to lead to a new round of uh, political negotiations? So I believe that what Martin Griffith is doing right now is is serious work. Uh, he's putting a lot of secrecy around what he's doing. He's making sure that there are no leaks are coming out of his office. He's been polite 
to every faction that he's met with. And he claims that all the talks have been fruitful. And it seems that just uh, before yesterday, he met with Yemeni President Abdurrabo Mansur Hadi in Aden. And they even talked about the possibility of exchanging prisoners as a first process to the peace method that he has in mind. The problem is we don't really know a lot about what he's planning for Yemen. We know that they want Hudaydah to be the first step towards peace, to kind of put pressure on everyone to kind of come to the table and engage in negotiations. And I think in a sense, it's good that nobody knows anything so that they can't ruin the process of moving forward. But to kind of touch upon what Fatma just said before me, Hudayda port is where 70% of the imports come into Yemen. And the Houthi-controlled territory uh, that is under occupation is pretty much uh, the most heavily populated part of Yemen. It has t- about 24 million citizens there. And so if you imagine during the conflict in Hudayda, if the of those 70% of imports are not allowed in, and the Yemenis uh, under Houthi control cannot have access to medicine or goods, it's quite devastating. And the problem in all of this too is that Yemen has two other ports that have not been uh, operating in the way that they should. By that you mean Mocha and Mokalla and uh, the port of Aden. Aden. Yeah. yeah. So we have those two ports, but none of them are able to carry in the imports into Yemen and distribute them distribute them as effectively as the Hudaydah port would. And it's not just because of the port uh, not having capacity to absorb such thing, but it's also about moving these goods into other parts of mm-hmm. Yemen. We have to kind of shed light on the fact that Right now, we're focusing on Hadeda, but all of Yemen is suffering. There are conflicts and clashes throughout Yemen uh, within factions that at least uh, seem to kind of uh, presumably operate well together. There, there are still conflicts going in. And most importantly, as I know this show is um, pre-recorded, but right now, for example, in Sana'a, there are airstrikes coming in targeting the airport of Sana'a and uh, the mountain in Atan. And so it's it's still a live war situation. So even there is even though there is a military pause in operations on Hudayda, it is still very explosive. And it's now to tie it back to what we're saying about the UN envoy, he's extremely careful not to ruin the delicate uh, balance of what's happening now and to kind of build upon. It. And so we see that all sides are saying that they're willing to negotiate, but nobody has done anything yet. So, for example, two days ago, they talked about the possibility of exchanging prisoners. Until they actually, in fact, exchange prisoners, we cannot say that this uh, peace process has begun. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's just shuttle diplomacy and talks, but nothing is moving forward. And so I think that you know, for the sake of the UN envoy and for the sake of peace in Yemen, it's important to keep our eyes on his process and to put our weight behind him. And here comes the international role where the five permanent members of the UN should really put their weight behind this UN envoy. And in Yemen, we have a really unique case in that the five permanent members seem to have a will towards peace in Yemen. Mm -hmm. They are not in conflict about the fact that in Yemen, we need to have peace. And that's that's really unique to what's happening in the in the Middle East. And I think we should really build on that. Absolutely. And uh, it certainly is a difference between uh, Yemen and, and Syria. But let me go back uh, uh, to Fatima on this on this very point. And that is that we had Mike Pompeo in, in Abu Dhabi. He spoke to the press afterwards. Certainly what he said about uh, about his conversations with the Emirati uh, senior leadership reflected uh, the concerns about Yemen. There is some I- indication that there's daylight between the U.S. and the coalition about how to go forward on the Yemen conflict. There is, again, emphasis from the U.S. side about the importance of the U.N. Um, uh, envoy's efforts, less uh, on the coalition effort in Hodeida. We have, of course, Senator Menendez, who's put a hold on arms sales to the Emirates. What, what's, uh, what are you hearing about uh, where the U.S. is on, on the support for Hodeida? If the U.S. is attempting to roll back from Iran's destructive influence in the region, then Yemen would be a really good place to start. If you pay attention to what Pompeo has said in his interview in the UAE, um, he said that there needs to be a global effort, need to rein Tehran's ambitions, and have it act as a normal country. And 
Iran's support here for the Houthis is becoming increasingly clear with time. They've supplied weapons, ballistic missiles, and it's all hindering from the political settlement process to proceed in good faith. You know, just yesterday there was a ballistic missile on Saudi Arabia, again, launched by the Houthis. Mm -hmm. It's a very futile effort. It doesn't get anywhere because it gets intercepted. But this hinders the possibility of, of peace and also shows that the Houthis are not quite serious, you know, and this is after the UN envoys sort of like optimistic messaging on, on the entire process, which, we, you know, a lot, we appreciate the efforts uh, that he's making. But at the same time, it's sort of like still still a new territory and, and he's the new UN envoy. And I think for, for us who have followed this process, we know that it often gets stifled at the very end. So building on that, I think the U.S. has provided tacit support for the Hodeida operation, while, of course, calling for prudence in terms of, you know, both targeting and proceeding with the operation. And it has also supported the U.N. special envoy uh, for Yemen, Martin Griffith, and is, is supporting a political solution. Iran is still key in this political solution. And up till now, Yemen is still a card in its hands. And it comes easily because the Houthis are also very willing participants, and um, they really want this unchecked power that they have at the moment. So Iran has, hasn't, has up till now, given any indication that it would help reign the Houthis. It has been so far empowering the militia, giving, I mean, not just material support, but immaterial support. Mm -hmm. All of these messages of solidarity, there isn't any signaling, you know, any anything, any shift in Iran's position that would say, hey, we're interested in peace. Let's work together. Of course, that's not in their interest. And this makes me really worried about the political process for Yemen, because right now you're seeing, you know, it's the Yemeni government talking with the Houthis and you have the Emiratis involved, the Saudis involved. And then where is Iran in all of this? Right. We don't really know. Right, and, and the problem is that uh, within the government of Iran, you have a division uh, between the foreign minister, um, Javed Zarif, who perhaps would be more willing to, to talk about uh, Yemen, and then the IRGC, which, of course, is uh, on the ground in Yemen. And, and certainly, uh, I think, looking at the situation there, um, as something that's pretty positive from their perspective, in the in the sense that they're pressuring uh, the Saudis, but 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 Samar, let me uh, let me ask uh, about that, and and of course the in a lot of ways this is a battle for hearts and minds inside of Yemen, and uh, and uh, the question being, you know, how do the Yemeni people perceive? What's happening uh, inside of of the country, between the the Houthis, the Hadi government, the coalition, uh, the United Nations? How do people there feel about the situation? Is it is one side winning greater support, or is there a pox on all of your houses kind of attitude among the Yemeni people themselves? So, as one would expect, the war has divided Yemenis on. Who, whom they consider the main aggressor in this conflict and whom they would like to side with. But I think that confidently I can say the majority of Yemenis are at a point where they want peace and they want their lives to return to normalcy. And that means that they want their jobs to be restored. They want to be able to return to their homes. They want to be able to have access to goods and medicine and to kind of carry on with life. And the problem with this particular conflict is since the start of the war till now, it seems that everything is getting worse with time. And by that, I mean, for example, as an observer of the conflict, uh, the Houthi uh, coalition, the, the Houthi alliance that existed with Arab al Saleh was fractured and the Houthis managed to gain more strength in Yemen since the war started. And that's alarming and that's very much a need for peace. And by that, what I mean is at the start of the war, the Houthis had no capacity to launch missiles into Saudi Arabia or into other parts of Yemen, but today they do. And it's alarming that this conflict 
kind of encouraged them to to seek their ambition even further uh, than they had imagined. And on top of that, I wanted to talk about the Yemeni population's grievances, where if they're under Houthi control, they have to kind of surrender to the reality of what's going on because their lives are at threat. In the south of Yemen, which is a Houthi liberated territory, there aren't very clear signs that there would be stability there. And that's also alarming when we talk about post-conflict resolution. And it seems that the situation in Yemen is really unstable. But what we're seeing right now, especially with the Battle of Hodeidah, is that a lot of Yemenis are internally displaced. And there's been a report from the UN that thousands of Yemenis have fled from the city of Hodeidah to the city of Sana'a, to Ib, to Aden, to Hadramaut. And those displaced individuals, as they're going to other cities, have struggled to find housing because neither side had planned for those displaced individuals accurately or correctly. So they had to kind of fend for themselves. And as they go to cities, those who have money struggle to find housing because, of course, the rental prices shot up when there is a new influx of, of people coming in. And those who don't have money can't even afford to go anywhere. And then in, in some places, the displaced individuals had to face a sort of racism based on geography where they weren't allowed into mm. specific areas based on where they're from. And so these little signs are warning us about what's to come in the future. And so Yemenis are ready for peace more than ever. They want this conflict to end. They would like to focus on their own lives and to build their future once and for all. Just on that point, if we think about, you know, Yemeni's former composition, the Arab Spring and what happened, you had, you know, all of the political parties that were once even, even the ones that were somewhat sympathetic to the Houthis, including the GPC, that had the General People's Congress, which is former President Saleh's party, had allied with the Houthis, ironically. And after Saleh's death, you know, the GPC is fractured because it's under control of, of the Houthi militia and the Houthi mm -hmm. grip. So you've got the Islah Party, which stands resolutely against the Houthis, Nasserites, the Southerners. You've got, you know, the GPC. And, and we can see that from, you know, Tariq Saleh's forces. You've got, you've got civilians enlisting in the military, the joint forces, and because they have a cause. And I think we're at a stage where people are saying, we are fed up from Houthi militia control. And I think that's important to listen to. People I speak to in Ma'rib, in Adan, in Taz, there are being, I mean, including the displaced people, they're being constantly shelled by the militia. This is where it's important to realize that a political solution is important, of course, and rolling back from Houthi's Iranian influence in, the, in, in Yemen is extremely important to achieve that objective. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm afraid that that's all we have time for today. I'm pretty confident that we'll be back having additional conversations about Yemen in the uh, in the future. I want to thank Fatima Al-Asrar and Samal Hamdani for joining us today. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this program, please be sure to subscribe and share it with your friends. You can send us comments on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.